you don't understand your purpose on the planet, what you're living for and what you're doing, it's very hard to consistently push yourself to be better at anything. Mm. And that's especially in the culture we have now and how weak men are. Like, people just become at home playing computer games, don't know what to do with their lives. They become losers. Cool. The thing that people don't understand, and loads of people watching this podcast will not understand how difficult jiu-jitsu is, how difficult MMA is, how difficult boxing is. They look in and think it's easy. It's insanely complicated. It's and Tate is so dead, like, on the money with his feedback and brutal to these guys, like, brutal. And I was like, oh, like, I, I can't. I, I just remember the feeling that I had, like, in my gut. Like, oh, but the only reason he's low income is because of his mentality, sir. Mm -hmm. His mentality towards money, his mentality towards women, his mentality towards physical health. Like, to generate money now has never been so easy. It's literally never been so easy. Like, and people use it as a scapegoat. Oh, I'm doing this for my family, or I'm doing this for my wife. No, focus on yourself, make yourself the best version of yourself, and that will help your family yeah. as a byproduct. Yeah. He comes to me and I'm like, I think I broke my jaw. <laughs> and he said, open your mouth. And I open, and he goes, now you just crack some teeth. Just, uh, you'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> right, right, right. I went back out, won the fight by TKO, come back, and Robbie's like, bro, you broke your jaw, let's go to the hospital. <laughs>
And when you put on an event and you have all the different logistical problems and things that recently last year we had a, last year or this year? I think it was last year, but I'll probably get corrected. Um, the time moves so quickly. When it comes yeah. to time, it's talking about months and year, I'm useless. Mm. Uh, but we put on an event in Gibraltar, a fighting event, right. but it was for like entrepreneurs who'd never had a fight before. It was their first fight <laughs> they'd ever had. Um, and we ended up doing it in uh, Gibraltar Rock, like in. I don't know. We did boxing and kickboxing. But I've done boxing, kickboxing, and MMA on the events, but this one was just boxing and kickboxing. And we had it inside Gibraltar Rock, which is like the first time it's ever been done and the last time it'll ever be done, trust me, because they, <laughs> they kicked up. Um, but we had so many logistical challenges to put on this event because the ring, obviously, people don't know Gibraltar. It's on the southern coast of Spain where I live. I live in Marbella. And Gibraltar was like a part of the UK, but on the same coast. Mm -hmm. So you, you drive there in 45 minutes. Me being an idiot, thought, we'll just drive there, whatever, and put on the event and put all the stuff together. I hired a ring, like a boxing ring, from Marbella. And on the way driving it to Gibraltar, we got stopped at customs. And you're not allowed to bring a boxing ring across a border without the right paperwork because it counts as customs bringing in wood or something like that. Well, so there's a tax no you way. have to pay and all this crap. So... The day of the or the day before the event, I was at dinner hosting Monday my event. We had 112 people there. I'm hosting a dinner for the, for this event, and I get a phone call saying we can't get the ring across because of customs. So in that 24 hour period, the fights were the next day. I had to source a ring for in Gibraltar. We couldn't find one, so I had to find builders that would build physically build a ring inside a cave, the oldest monolith in Europe. It's like how old it is. I had to source all this out whilst hosting a dinner and pretending everything was okay mm. and it was a bit of a challenge <laughs> so once we got through the event was incredible like probably the best thing i've done as a as an event still to this day it was like incredible like some of the footage and pictures it was, it was an incredible moment uh and then the last guy that won his fight like i, I got to spray champagne all over him and it, it was just it was just yeah, a great same, time same with time. the boys um and yeah being able to do things like that we had a huge after party and it is like when you see those things come together, mm. that for me is something special. Yeah. So I, I get a real feel You've of- You've got to be passionate for shit, and yeah, If you're not passionate for it, you see it with fighters all the time, don't they? They lose the fucking fire, don't they? If they lose the fire, once they've lost the fire, it's gone. And if you can find it in someone else, you're lucky that you found event management in, because a lot of people don't, do they? See with pro footballers, they fucking go off the rails after, because it's probably fucking hard for you, isn't it? Uh, they say, uh, we were supposed to say, you know, like, you, so I've said been put a few different ways, but they say that fighters or celebrities or footballers mm -hmm. or athletes, they die twice. They die when their career ends and then they die when they die. So that's the, the first death is where, when your career ends. And my friend put it a different way and he said you have a social death because you identify as that person. Imagine if you played mm -hmm. for Manchester United and we're in Manchester, so I say Manchester United. Manchester City, because... He's a oh, United fan, mate, it's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's, he's a glory fan, mate. So he's a United fan. Okay, so imagine you play for Manchester City. Fuck it. <laughs> so you, you play for them, and then that's your whole life, your whole career. Mm. Everything about you is that you play for Manchester City, and then you stop. Who are you? What is your identity? So you have that social death, like the people think you die, you know, and you have to completely recreate yourself and become a whole new person. And it is extremely challenging, and I think... Most athletes, because they they live such a constrained life, like especially me fighting a middleweight, yeah. I had to diet consistently. To then go into the real world or, or the normal world and have to try and come up with a business idea, or you have so many distractions that you've avoided for so long, and that's why a lot of people struggle with alcoholism, drug abuse, all this sort of stuff. Because to become elite at anything, you have to be a psychopath. You have to be an addict. I was addicted to becoming the best fighter in the world. That's what I was. For me, the best fighter I could be. And when that addiction died, I had to replace that addiction with something else. And I think most people replace it with something negative mm. because they get lost. Yeah. And I think uh, I now, through that, through that process that I've gone through, even though I'm still relatively young at 35 years old, I now go into like mentoring young men who are struggling with these, these situations. Because if you don't understand your purpose on the planet, what you're living for and what you're doing, it's very hard to consistently push yourself to be better at anything. Mm. And that's especially in the culture we have now and how weak men are. Like people just become at home playing computer games, don't know what to do with their lives. They become losers because they have no purpose. Mm. We say this all the way up. Like, yeah. so fucking easy for people just to do nothing, to have no job, can sit at home, get paid, get free house, fucking all of it. 
And that's what we're doing. We're creating these weak fucking people that can just do that day in, day out. No repercussions. And it just never goes anywhere, does mm. it? But I think society is built like that now. It's yeah. built to create these people, these workers, these people that don't want to uh, achieve anything, especially in the UK, because we have like this what do you call it? Like put down humor, you know, the whole humor. Anyone in America, you're the, I'm the best man in the world. No one, but you say that in England, oh, shut up. Mm. Idiot. You know, it's, it's a very, mark. the mark, yeah, <laughs> the culture is very <laughs> self-deprecating. It's very, something I definitely learned through hanging around with the guys is like, you have to believe that you're the man to become the man. If you don't believe it, no one else is going to mm. believe it. Mm. So if you're too afraid to put yourself on a pedestal and to push yourself and become better, if you don't believe it, then how are you going to convince the rest of the world to believe that you're worth anything, you know? And I think it's so, there's so much fear of like fear of rejection and fear of failure and fear of life being difficult. People just want to live comfortably and they're pushed in this, this direction to comfortable living, enjoy, relax. Oh, you want to retire and live on a beach somewhere. It's, it's all this pipe dream that you're sold is absolute bullshit. And I think we sold that on every level of the media, on every level of interaction, of, on your parents that didn't do it because they didn't go after their dreams. So they don't want you to go after your dreams, even though they may not be the people that love you the most. They, they, mm. they project their failures onto you. And I think until you realize that as a man, it's very hard to break free from, from, from that situation. So I find extreme joy from mentoring people and talking to them about these problems. And all the problems are the same. Everyone's got yeah. the same problems. Yeah. And it's just going through them in a different way and highlighting. And I like to say, if you can identify the problem, then you can work out a way to fix it and then you can execute that. That's, mm -hmm. all, that's all that the system is. But first you have to identify the problems. And most people aren't willing to identify because they are completely unaware, like just, just what we call them NPCs or whatever, but they're just walking through life like, oh, yeah. whatever, and they're completely unaware and they're completely indoctrinated and they don't know anything. Or they're, they're, too, they're too afraid to analyze themselves. And I believe it's a superpower from fighting or from any athletic pursuit. That's why I think it's so important because you learn during a fight. Okay, I had a fight. I did this good, I did this bad. The way you improve is you watch it back and you say, I did this, that was good, that was bad, that was good, I need to do more of that, why don't I do that? And you analyze yourself. And once you learn how that's the secret to success, mm. looking at yourself, mm. like being truthful, being honest, Bit fucking honest and honest, honest with yourself, understanding your, 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 what you lack, understand what you need more of, and then training and improving those things. Once you apply that to life, Maybe you sucked at a job or you tried to pick up a girl and she ignored you. Or like, but then you can go back on those memories in your mind and be like, what did I do there? Okay, maybe that didn't work out. And you can be self-analytical and you can be honest. You can only get better. But most men just don't want to do that. I think me and Paul, when we first started our podcast, we were talking about things that we wanted to do. And this like one of the biggest things that we talked about that stopped us. Well, not stopped us, but were like a bit, it was just people around us. We didn't give a fuck about people out there. It's more about you know, your mates call you a fucking knob or, you know what I mean? You think, you know, when it's like judgment from people close to you to saying to you, you're a fucking knob, you, you know, you can't achieve that. Mm. It drives me on, you know what I mean? But, yeah, but I think Lou touched on it. I think it's a reflection of other people's failures. Yeah. And I think that's typically why they're in the beginning. I think they're quite supportive, but once you actually start doing well, it tends to see, you tend to see them <laughs> change the tune a little bit. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think, uh, yeah, I think you're spot on, mate. With the, um, with the people you work with, you mentioned that kind of entrepreneurs that you work with, they, they, it sounds like they're already kind of further along their journey. So what, what sort of challenges do you find that they have? Because I guess they aren't some of the people we've just talked about. They're, they've already kind of maybe identified a bit of purpose. Yeah. So what do, you, what do you kind of offer to entrepreneurs, people that are already successful to, to make them more successful? Well, because normally it depends on what you consider success. Mm. So when you say successful, most people think about it in a monetary term. So, okay, I, I'm, I made a million dollars, so now I'm successful. But most guys in their early 20s or early 30s that have made that sort of money have been completely ignoring one part of their life. So we try and break it down into three like pursuits. Pursuits of the number one should be the most important thing is health, people's physical being and, and, and their mental health. So most guys in this day and age that make those sort of figures, you know, seven, eight figures quickly, it comes from the IT field. Most of them are, you know, in computers in some way because that's how everything works now, mm -hmm. right? So most of these guys just, they find a path of success or they're very successful at one thing and they just go all in on it mm -hmm. and they ignore their health. That's number one. So normally 
when you've ignored your health for so long, let's say you've been ignoring it for eight to 10 years, when you start to get that back on track, your whole life improves because you feel better about yourself. You, you, you know, you look yourself in the mirror better, all these sort of things. So again, it's identifying where you lack those things. Number two is going to be relationships. And that could be relationship with yourself, your self relationship, with partners, with business partners, with women, whatever you want to call it. That's always lacking as well. And then number three is money. But money comes at the end. Business and money always comes at the end of what you should be trying to achieve. But most people, because they're indoctrinated to think that way, they look at life the other way around. They think, once I get the money, I'll be able to do this, 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 and this. But it's like, so yes, in certain cases, the, the entrepreneurs, especially that I deal with, have got the money. But they've sacrificed social skills. Mm. They've sacrificed health. They've sacrificed confidence. They can't stand up in a room and talk. They can't, there's so many things that they could improve their lives. So they could be successful financially. But when you're successfully financed, this is a, the, the, I mean, when you look at it from a business perspective, in my eyes, this is what makes it great is, okay, you've got money, but you need this and this. I can give you this and this. Give me some of your money. Mm. And I'll, I've got loads of money. Here for money. <laughs> yeah. Just solve this problem for me. Yeah. One of the guys I dealt with, he goes, I would, I would spend any amount of money to solve this problem. All I need is someone who can solve this problem for me. Yeah. Okay, I can solve that problem. So I take them through these techniques and we talk. And we, it's just about understanding the, the ideology that you have to become uncomfortable to, only, to go through anything. Mm. So if you suck with women, you've got to talk to a thousand women. Once you talk to a thousand women, it gets a bit easier, right? You know what I mean? Like it's, it sounds stupid, but it's that simple. We're just going through the hardship. You need someone to just push you in that direction. Same with physical condition and physical health. It sucks getting up at six o'clock in the morning and go to the gym every day. It sucks, but get used to it. Because if you want to be in great shape and it's like reframing like pain as a negative and making it a positive because most people run away from difficulties. They run away from pain. They run away from everything that gives you personal growth. So you have to try and make them understand that if you want this, you need to do this. And, and if they, again, if you understand where you're going and you understand what the, if, if I said to you, okay, you can be in the best physical condition of your life, you just need to do X, Y, and Z. If you understand what the, the result is going to be and you have purpose and you know why you want it and you know when you want to get it by, all you need is the sacrifice of this and this, you're much more likely to, to give that sacrifice. Mm. It's much easier. So once you... You have to, it's a lot of retraining people's brains because most people, they have even hyper successful people in the, in the monetary field that make a lot of money, they have such bad identification with themselves. They look at themselves so, so negatively and they talk about themselves so negatively. And once you can change that in their mind, they just excel. They excel physically, they excel in their relationships, they feel confident. And once those things happen, their business gets better as well. So they get win, win, win. And then they have a much better, well-rounded you know, life. Mm. And how did you, how did you sort of identify that as a skill set, and how did you repurpose it to, to from fighting to that? Well, I mean, it's basically what you do with fourteen-year-old kids that want to know MMA. I know it sounds really <laughs> it was crazy, but the uh, we were talking about it. You're a personal trainer, right? Yeah. So when you're a personal trainer and you deal one-on-one -on -one with these people, they're not coming there to. Most of them are not coming there to to do chest press. They're not. They're coming to. Like, like an agony aunt, mate. Yeah, agony yeah. aunt. Talk to you about their problems. I had this. Yeah. And, and I spent 10 years, because I, even though I was in the UFC and doing all that stuff, I used to run gyms. And mm -hmm. from an early, the, when, I started, when I started my MMA journey, I, I decided to move into a gym and sleep on the floor and have no money. And the only way I could feed myself was to coach beginners. So I, I, I've been coaching as long as I've been fighting. So I've, about 17 years that I've been doing one on one coaching with people. And they all come to you with the same problems. And talk to you. So when you can repurpose those people with their belief systems, talk to them, like I said, a 14-year-old kid who doesn't have a dad, who's coming to you and he's told you about his problems that he has with girls or problems that he has with his mom, or you, you just deal with it over and over and over again. And you, you get great joy out of building these individuals up. I, I got a couple of kids in specifically that like, didn't know how to fight became good fighters. I cornered them. They did things that I told them to do. They kind of like they, the joy you get from teaching people how to win and then them winning, it massively outweighs you winning. Uh, it's like hard to explain, mm. but that, that process of going through that. And this again is that conversation I said, when I had with Andrew, he said, you don't understand all of the skills that you possess from your life, from fighting at an elite level that you just need to repurpose and re-understand them and, and share them with the world and share them with people. And if you took your client from being a 14-year-old boy 
you have to completely, you have to do all of the same things, the exact same skill set, and you take that to an entrepreneur who's in his 30s and making eight figures, you just change the price point. Mm -hmm. So it's like that, identifying that, it sounds so simple. Mm -hmm. You're like, okay, but then how do I market? How do do And you give all the the, the problems. No, 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 no. don't come to me with all those problems. Just do it. Okay, so it's, uh, that was a big light bulb moment for me. And I've had, Many and many and many of those since mm-hmm. having these relationships and being with these people and running these events, like with the entrepreneurial events, we have a hundred people there that make seven figures or, or multiple six figures. And I just listen to the conversations mm. and you see how they're, they're thinking and their mindset and everything. But some of them still can't do 10 push ups. Mm-hmm. So it's like they're, they're, everyone's got a pain point, yeah. identifying pain points. And then it's a. Uh, it's such a simple process once you, I mean, you have to apply yourself. I, I mean, I've worked like an insane man for the last three, four years of my life. But before that, I was working like an insane man just fighting. Mm-hmm. So it's a different, I just repurpose my energy and, and my intentions. And as long as it comes from, this is in my opinion, when it comes from a place where you're trying to help people yeah. and you, you're completely honest and you don't try and sell bullshit, you always win. Mm-hmm. Even if you don't get that many clients, the clients that you get are going to be thankful for it. And then once you get clients that are thankful, that they, they, they sell the product for you. You know what I mean? It's like well, a person it's not for the right reason. You've always got to do it for the right reason. If you fucking hate what you do, no matter what money it is, it's <clears throat> well, it's like the financial success for me. I see it as a byproduct is uh, of presenting value to the world. So, okay. Someone said this to me on a podcast because I'm doing podcasting now as well. So I, I, you get a lot of information from these guys. And he said this to me and I'll never forget it. I've said it on a few podcasts since. But he said, um, the ba- your bank balance is a direct reflection of the amount of value you add to the world. And I never thought of money like that as a value exchange. And he's like, the more the value you can add to the world, if it's, if, if it's a positive thing and people want it, they will pay for it. And the more value you add, the more they pay and the more money you make. Mm. So it's, then you've got to leverage it, reach more people, all the other things that have got to happen. But I know that I add extreme value to people's lives and that's why my bank balance looks like it does because I'm adding value. But now I need to be able to scale it, which I'm actually going through right now with, with, with a different system. But working one-on-one with, like I said, high-level entrepreneurs that I've been doing for a while, it's just shown me the possibility of tra- uh, coaching a 14-year-old kid's mindset to coaching a 35-year-old guy's mindset who makes it the same. It's all mm-hmm. the same. Everyone deals with the same problems. There's different answers. Maybe it's a bit more complex, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's just that's where I repurpose the energy from, to answer your question. It's like from be- being a co- I've been a coach for, like I said, 17 mm-hmm. years. Now I'm like a mentality coach. I hate the phrase life coach or anything like that, but I'm... I was going to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. you get like a fucking 12-year-old going, I'm a life coach. Oh, <laughs> don't make yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I always try and draw from experience. So it's like my life has been a lot of ups and downs. I've had to put in a lot into like competing. To, to compete as an elite athlete in any sport is extremely difficult. To do it in the UFC say, is... There, there's nothing harder. I honestly believe there's nothing harder than what I've done. Um, physically like to push yourself but it's none of it's to do with the body and it's all to do with the mind so the system that I created to take myself from like I said giving up my job I used to work in London in marketing gave up that job to move to my gym to sleep on the floor for two three years to go to the armor fire to compete in the UFC the system mental system that I created to push myself to do those things I now just use that and teach other people so it's mm-hmm. it's all drawn from personal experience and I know it works because I did it mm-hmm. so like one of the things I, I teach people, which in England, I think it's a bit, people look a bit frowned upon, but well not frowned upon, but they look down on it, is like affirmations, like positive affirmations, which sounds gay, sounds American, sounds like, oh, whatever, but it works. There's no, it works. And, and I know because I said to myself for three years that I will fight in the UFC by the time I am 25. I said it to myself for three years, every single day. And I got to the Armour Fire, I got my debut in the UFC, and my debut in the UFC was on my 25th birthday. <laughs> and it's not, and when, once the universe kind of works like that, and these things happen to you, and I turned pro, and by the time I fought in the UFC, I think it was 24 months or 23 months from turning pro to fighting in the UFC, is like, it's fast to go, for, to go through what I did. So 24 months? 24 months, yeah. 23 months, that's 23 right. yeah, months that's right. from turning pro to fighting the UFC. And, I'd only, and I started fighting when I was 18, 19. Okay. So like amateur, I did yeah. a bit of a longer amateur career. I had 11 fights when I was amateur, a couple of kickboxing, a couple of boxing, whatever. So I had like three years behind me of amateur, then 
then I was 25 and I was fighting in UFC. And the only reason that I believe, the only reason that happened is because of my system, the things I was saying to myself, the positive reinforcement, the training journals I was doing, all these things that I was doing outside of the training that most people don't do. Yeah. Tell us more about the system, mate. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I talk about it quite a lot, but it's, it's basically I set up, I mean, maybe I've used this word, I set up like mental mechanisms that can make sure that you stay on track. So you stay away from d d distractions. You can, you every single day you're focused on, I, I call it your clarity of purpose. So the thing that you want to achieve. So you have to first identify what that thing is. The way we identify it is we look at you as an individual and understand that the only person on the planet you are competing against is yourself. So if you want to be better than you are today and you want to be better tomorrow, then you need to understand the things that you want to improve at. And that sounds simple, but most people don't even know what they want to do. Yeah. And I always talk about like a boat. I say, like, imagine if you get on a boat and you're traveling through the sea. If you don't know the destination, then the waves are going to take you wherever they feel that you're going to go and you're going to end up somewhere that you didn't even know. If you know I want to go to this specific point, then, then you're going to start plotting out your course, right? Once you know the destination, you plot out your course, then you've got to build out your boat to make sure your boat can handle the waves and, and the journey and all these different things. But the system in itself is just identifying these things, building lists that you can then fall back on. I mean, I won't go too into it. And then making things like daily affirmations and setting yourself up so you can be completely focused on what you want to achieve every single day. So it doesn't matter. And another part of it is, is like your routine. I know like daily routines are a bit gay and overdone, like in the morning, morning, millionaire's morning routine. It's not like that, but it's like having root, like a bedtime routine and a morning routine, I think is super essential to getting ahead. It doesn't mean like from the biggest thing I think is the mobile phone and getting the mobile phone outside of your bedroom. So if you, everyone charges their phone by their bed and it's the first thing they see in the morning, it's the last thing they see at night. And I think that's the, the the complete disconnect from reality, disconnect from the world that we live in, and it's a stress magnet. Like if I woke up and looked at my phone before I did anything else, I would my life would be a lot different to how it is now because my phone is full of stress, it's full of problems, it's full of things I've got to solve. So that first 20, 30 minutes in the day, I just wanna spend it with myself, mm -hmm. my kids, my wife. Like I just wanna spend it like focusing on my life and where I wanna go and what I wanna do, and I want no distractions to hit me this early. So that's like, it's very simple. Yeah. Thing again, you talk about how you, if you've got a guy who runs a, a, a seven, eight figure business mm -hmm. and he's with, <clears throat> got his phone by his bed and he wakes up, if you run a seven, eight figure business, trust me, there's stress. Mm -hmm. So when you look at your phone, you're like, fuck, I'll do this. I'll do that, I'll do that. And it just ruins your whole day. Yeah. Stop shit in a bad fucking way. Doesn't it? So maybe you're just as successful, but you're successful when you're a much happier person and enjoying your life a lot more and you're living through it much better. And trust me, 20 minutes, 30 minutes before you start solving that problem, it's still going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and like I always like to say that if there's a problem in your, if you consider you have a problem and that thing will still be a problem in a hundred days, then it's a problem. But most of the time in a hundred days, you would have forgotten about it and mm -hmm. it doesn't even matter. And you'll call, you make it a problem, but it's not really. And, um, you know, I think those small, there's, there's a lot to it. I, I do like a, like an eight to 12 week rehaul of people's lives. And I talk to them very, very deeply about what they do and I give them tasks. And, you know, at the moment I'm currently in the, I literally launched it a couple of weeks ago, but I've turned it into rather it being a one-on-one -on -one interaction where it's us, you know, it takes a lot of my time and I, I call you and we're doing weekly catch-ups. I'm texting you every day and all that sort of stuff. It's now like I've condensed it and made it like a video course mm. so people can go through it and say it's obviously not as effective mm. but it's also not the same price point because i charge a lot of money to 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 deal with my time so the price point is a lot lot smaller but it can still really impact as a lot and now it can impact a lot more people again going back to the value bank balance is like i could put out a lot more value into the world by making a digestible way that people can get hold of it and they can do it rather than only the plug uh, depending on speaking to me one-on-one -on -one. i can only speak to mm. three or four people at a time i'm too busy with my other stuff going on you know yeah hopefully that's enough about the system yeah it's good system <laughs> mate. good system um at the very beginning you mentioned about you had an event where you had a lot of entrepreneurs coming in fighting um i i did i, I feel a, a fool saying this in front of you but i did some amateur mma back in the day so i've been in a cage so i know what it feels like we do jujitsu now and for us, I think working together, having a scrap, just just really fucking helps. Do you find, do you, do you, is, this, is, that, is that like a regular thing that you do with a lot of your clients? Do you get them into martial arts and, and fighting? 
Um, I believe for any man on the planet, they should be out of fight. Mm -hmm. I believe it's like within us. And I think anyone who disagrees, they, they're only disagreeing because they don't want to do it mm -hmm. because it's fucking hard. And I think you, again, anyone who doesn't want to fight, you don't have to like be an elite UFC fighter, but if you cannot protect yourself, protect your family, walk around with confidence, understanding that you could be in an altercation and you can handle yourself, the amount that doing violent things helps you as an individual, jiu-jitsu is a great example. Mm. I know hundreds and thousands of people that do jiu-jitsu, they're not violent people. Mm. They just want to learn how to do it. And it's so technical. The thing that people don't understand, and loads of people watching this podcast will not understand how difficult jiu-jitsu is how difficult mma is how difficult boxing is they look in and they think it's easy it's insanely complicated it's easy until they get like a, a, a blue belt pin at them yeah <laughs> you know yeah. what i mean they go into any gym and just ask a blue belt to pin them and try and get them exactly they fucking won't exactly never 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 never, never, never. And, then, and and it's it's once so that's what happened to me so i i was one of these obnoxious idiots who thought fighting was easy. I was 18 years old and I used to work as a doorman because I was big, I was tall, I wanted to try and get pussy. Great, let's be a doorman, you know? So I worked with a friend of mine, Jack Mason, who was a professional fighter. He'd had like 10 pro fights or something, but he's five foot 10. I'm six foot six. I'm like, smashy, bro. What's up? Don't worry about it. <laughs> and he said, okay, come down the gym. So we ended up going down the gym and I ended up training with a guy called Robbie Olivier, who I'd I don't want to do him dirty, but I think he's about five foot four, maybe five. five. <laughs> but, he, height, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but, <I'm saying. laughs> but he used to fight a, a featherweight. He was a cage rage back in the day. Oh, yeah. Cage rage featherweight champion, Robbie right. the Flame Olivier. Great guy. And I sparred him and he raped me. And I mean like in Paris, <laughs> like because he was a brown belt, black belt in judo, oh, hell, yeah. cage rage champion in MMA. Like, like, Tight and, and you're like fucking Bambi in you when you first go in. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> pushed over and you're gone in you. And we drove like for this because this is back in the days, like 17 years ago, or maybe a little bit less than that. 15 years ago, no, it's 17 years ago. Um, and we had to drive to Cambridge from Essex because we used to live in Chelmsford. So we drove an, drove an hour and a half to go to this gym, and I've been telling Jack I'm going to smash him up. And I was in the car, and on the way home. From this, uh, there was there was Robbie, and then there was another guy called AJ Wen who bad me as well. And obviously, like now it's so obvious, but at the yeah. time you're so confident. And then driving home, I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all right." You know, and I was so deeply embarrassed, like unbelievably, it hit me to my core. And I was like, "I cannot walk the streets knowing that a five foot four <laughs> Man could do that. To <laughs> yeah, we could highlight the fact you're five a two-stripe four. white belt, mate. So <laughs> five four is fine. <laughs> but you know, he could do that to me. A two-stripe two white belt would a same. He'd be able to do that to me back then. So it's like I couldn't live with myself like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 he's, I, he's, he, he's probably a blue belt to me. Okay, okay. He, he's a good two-stripe white belt. <laughs> but still, back then I knew yeah. nothing, so I would have got, yeah, got yeah, destroyed. Yeah. Um, but people don't understand that, though, do they? The, they do not understand even like six months of training what it would do for you for the rest of your life you know they, they do not realize you know mm. you, you see people all the time thinking walking around they think they're hard this and that and you think if you just got hold of someone they're, they're not doing anything it's know? uh the wolf there's that thing i spoke about it recently but if you spend 18 minutes a day doing something you're better than 95 percent of the planet so when it comes to jujitsu if you get a two-stripe white belt i actually use that as the you get become a two-stripe white belt you are better than 95% of the planet. Literally. You are li but you, literally. Yeah. Facts. Facts. You know Lux. what I mean? So it's like it. a lot of guys will go in there, they're athletic, they're like, but they'll give up so quickly because they can't deal with the ego of being bashed and them losing and some little girl choking them out. They can't deal with it. So it, it burned me so hard that I had to become good at it. And then once I got good at it, I'm not good. I got a very addictive personality. So once I, I didn't get, I didn't get good at it for I'm some while. Mate, I'm training like twice a day. I'm fucking in. You know what I mean? I say to him all the time, I'm like, it's fucking all I really think about. Yeah. You know I mean, it's sad, but it's fucking true, isn't it? Because there's so many levels to it, mate. You feel like you're getting good and then uh, like just someone like a purple belt just come in and just click, fucking rape me. I'm like, oh, fucking hell. Oh, I don't know anything again. Start yeah. again. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I, he does it to me. Like, I use it like I say, the more it's filled. Like jujitsu or fighting, the more you learn, the less you know. That's yeah. how it feels like. You learn, you know less. And um, but anyway, to answer the question, I, I believe any man should be able to do it because mm -hmm. you will put yourself in the darkest situations that, you, that you've ever been in. And they say like when you fight, 
a person, like you said, you had a cage fight, when they have a cage fight, you know that man better than most other people know you mm -hmm. because you've been in such an intense and dark place. So when it comes to like your tea that I, I went to battle with multiple times, we were like this and we still are. I know the, I could bring them up and ask them anything mm -hmm. because I know, I really truly know who they are because they've seen me in such dark positions. So for these entrepreneurs, that, like I said, they've conquered the money game. Okay, you've conquered the money game. Well done, bro. Uh, but have you felt that it doesn't matter how much, this is what I love about fighting. I love it. This was back in the day because everyone used to look down on me because I was, I quit my job and I lived, I slept on the floor. Mm. It's like when you step on that mat or the tatami, whatever you want to call it, everyone is equal. All that matters is how much time you have put in on the mat. It doesn't matter if you're a lawyer, no, I mean, doctor, entrepreneur, any I don't care. Are you better than me at jiu-jitsu? Or are you better than me at MMA? That's all I care about because I'm going to come. You know what I mean? And that's the, 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 that mentality for me, it just gave me like a fresh reset, I think, in my life. Because, you know, I was a bit of a lost kid and all my mates went to university and I was like not doing going that way and not doing that. So I was like, okay. Then I found this fighting thing and then I was on the mat with the lawyer, on the mat with the doctor and I'd, bust them up and be like, you know, I used to, yeah, I did that. So that gives you that to time. And when you step on it, it's like a reset button. It's like, okay, how much time have you done with this? And then we'll, we'll find out. And I think that's what made me uh, like fall in love with it. Mm -hmm. And I think the support network that I got from my guys, I was super lucky to step into the tsunami gym and be with the boys. And, and I, um, I think I fought for a long time just to impress them. Like, I think that was like why I did it. It wasn't like a personal journey. It was like a, I wanted affirmation from those guys that I was the man because they sit back in the day, 20 years ago, it, if you walk on the mat, it's like you have to earn people's respect. Mm. So I wanted to earn their respect. There's, well, there's a story about uh, Tommy Maguire, basically John, John Maguire's brother, mm -hmm. who was a great fighter himself. He was like a hard man. You know, okay. he's a gypsy. He's a, he's a tough man. He's a ginger lad, wasn't he? Ginger lad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Great fighter. Really, really good fighter. The reason he never made it was probably the commitment level on his 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 body, like his diet and all those yeah. sort of things, and you know, kind of a, a few gypsy ways that held him back. But he was an incredible fighter, a real happy in it. Like could have been, could have been. I mean, he was fantastic, but he could have been like elite level. Um, I remember when he fought a, a few guys back back in the day, and they, he was knocking people out. Southpaw, dangerous guy. Anyway, I started training in the gym, and he wouldn't even talk to me because he thought I was some posh kid from down south that would just want you know <laughs> just having a go. Yeah, um, and he li literally said, "Don't fucking talk to me." Mm. Like, literally, and I was like, and then I had my first amateur fight, which is about six to eight months later, mm. and I fought a guy called Pacman, Alan Pacman, on UWC in South End, and I went out there. I did not know how to fight. My hands were here, and he was a big. He's a good jujitsu fighter now. Had a Pac a Pacman, real good jujitsu guy, um, and he broke my jaw in the first round. I hit me real hard with some overhands. And I went back to the corner and Robbie, the guy I said yeah. about, he um, he comes to me and I'm like, I think I broke my jaw. And he said, open your mouth. And I open and he goes, now nah, you just crack some teeth. Just uh, you, you'll be fine. <laughs> right, right, right. And I went back out, won the fight by TKO, come back and Robbie's like, bro, you broke your jaw, let's go to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that, that's what fighting was like back then. You know what I mean? An amateur kid, 18, 19 years old, going into an amateur fight, it's do or die, mm -hmm. especially the mentality of tsunami. And then I come back to the changing rooms. There's a picture of it still, and then Tommy's like standing on my uh, standing on my shoulder. And after that, he comes, shook my hand, and said, "Well done, bro." And he started speaking to me. So I earned his respect. But see, it's your character. Through it. It. It's your character. You you find out people's character on the mat. Yeah. You and through through what you go through, you know, mm -hmm. you can roll with someone, and sometimes, you know. You, you'll roll with someone, you can really see their character tap early, oh, don't do that, you know what I mean? And then you get some cunts who are just fucking next to kill you, you know what I mean? And mm. those are the people that you kind of like lean to towards if you are like that as well, yeah. you know what I mean? If if you're a bit of a cunt yourself, <laughs> you go towards, you do do, don't you? Like yeah. some of the shit this fuck has done to me, especially when I first started, mate, fucking dirty bastard, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oil, oil check. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. <laughs> but that's, I thought that was normal, mate. Yeah. <laughs> but again, that comes down to, like, you used the great word of character, and, and you, again, back in the day when no one was training, it wasn't a big thing, no one really understood what it was. I was the guy that become so addicted to it, and, and I, I was, uh, another reason I think I, I progressed quite quickly is because I was the guy at the door waiting for, like, if you were showing up and you were better than me, I'm training for you. I so said, I want to train with you because mm -hmm. you're going to teach me something. And there's a specific fighter called Lee Dosky, and he was a black belt. And he 
had had, I don't know how many fights, but he had a load of fights. And he was a welterweight, I think. Yeah, welterweight. And he used to twist me up. So every time he'd come, I'd be like, let's go, me and you. And then he'd, then he'd do something like, what was that? How do you do that? And, and he used to dash me, I remember. And he said, so what was that? And he, he, every time he'd come to the, the gym, I was waiting. He used to say I was like a, like a dog, you know, like <laughs> waiting for me at the door. And, uh, and I was young. I, I don't, now, now it makes sense to me, but at the time I was like, what are you on about? Because he was like in his 30s and I was, in my, I was 20. You know, and, and I was like foaming at the mouth to spar with him before he'd even got in and chilled out and he'd just driven an hour to come train. And I'm like, and, uh, and I learned so much from him because I was thirsty for that knowledge because I wanted to take on the biggest challenge in the room. I mean, Dusky was... was because he used to come twice a week. So those two times I wanted him. I had John and Jack and the other guys every day, so it was different. Um, and yeah, he always used to say, like, leave me the fuck alone. Like, go away. I wanna, you know, <laughs> let me chill out or whatever. Um, and I remember Dusky for uh, on Cage Rage as well. I don't know if it was Cage Rage then or Ultimate oh, Challenge or whatever it was. And he broke his arm and then carried on fighting and won. And I, I'll never forget that. Like, an absolute... He, he's a guy who missed a generation as well because if he'd have come up now... And understand that, like, what you help people understand the sport and stuff. Now he would have been a lot, a lot higher up there. But he was like, how I look at it is like, these guys made all the mistakes. Mm. They they took any fight, any week, any month, and then then I was like the first guy from the gym that they'd made all the errors. And I was like, no, 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 no why don't we just do the? And they they guided me a bit better, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I did amateur fights, not straight away into pro fights. Because I think Dosky's record, he ended up like seventeen and fifteen or mm -hmm. something like that, which sounds terrible. But no one had a clue what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And he's still an absolute warrior and a great fighter. And I think uh, now he has a gym. Uh, he's a black belt. He has a jiu-jitsu gym and everything else. But like going after those challenges is what I think is important when you're, you're saying like you, 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 you resonate with those people and I was one of those people that just I wanted the tough fight every single day mm. and I think that's what makes you better if you want to be a soft cunt mm. yeah. we're not interested yeah. you know what I mean see the character straight away yeah, yeah. Straight away. yeah we, we talked before I think about the fact that when you go for that adversity on the mats it kind of dials down sort of everything else that's happening outside yeah. of the mats and I remember when I did have a couple of amateur bouts for me, I took a very systematic approach. So in the morning, I got up, I was like, right, just make it to the car. Let's get to the venue. Right, let's just get to the, the medical. <laughs> let's do the weigh-in. And before I knew I was in the cage and I was competing. And I've kind of used that in some aspects of my life now. And do you find that that's the benefit with maybe the people you work with or the entrepreneurs? Is it the fact that they live, as you say, these crazy, stressful lives, but you put them through a bit of adversity on the mat or in, in the gym, you put them in a ring. Do you find that then that kind of changes their perspective? I think I would talk about this a lot with stress. Like if you actually look at what the definition of stress is, it's a reaction to a life-threatening situation. So like stress is the idea that you become stressed when a tiger's trying to eat you. We obviously don't have that anymore. Like in the modern world, no one should be stressed because no one's dying. You know what I mean? So stress is made up. Like I always say, you've got like direct stress or you've got bullshit made up stress. 99% of the stress you feel is bullshit made up stress. And the only reason I know that is because I've done the physical activity where I've nearly died mm -hmm. constantly, consistently. And we do like the best, the best thing you can do for even if I've got an entrepreneur that can actually fight a little bit, can box a little bit, it's decent, sweet. You go in the ring, we're going to have a new fresh partner every 60 seconds, we're going to go for 10 minutes. You just, you're done. You, you cannot win. Like, and when you have to, you have to submit to the fact that I'm just going to give it everything and I'm going to go as hard as I can and do as well as I can for as long as I can. And then you feel like you're going to die. And then when you feel like you're going to die, that's the feeling that you want mm. because then all the other stuff going on in your life, it, it doesn't matter. That's another thing that, that like jujitsu fighting, jujitsu too, but for me more boxing because you can get hit in the face. It's a bit more aggressive. Like that takes away all the other stress. I'm sure it's the same for you. You've got a million things going on, the kids, business, podcasts, all this, da, 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 jiu-jitsu. I can only think about this guy. I wasn't going to die. Yeah, that's uh, fucking it. it. So it, everything else melts away. So I think, yes, making people deal with that adver adversity can show them how unimportant their problems are, uh, but it doesn't necessarily help them uh, thrive and become better, mm -hmm. but it can make them understand that, you know, they can... They can leave that day. You know, uh, you're not going to die. Don't worry about it. It's not going to be that bad. Maybe they're embarrassed. A lot of the time it's like, I don't want to say this. Or I don't want this to happen because I'll be embarrassed. It's like, bro, embarrassed by who? About what? You said it, I think, uh, uh, and I was going to make a point, but then we carried on. It was like the people around you 
are saying, oh, you can't do that. You shouldn't mm-hmm. do that. Like when you care, that's what happens a lot with these guys. They get to a certain place in life and they're so worried about what other people think because they've been in this little, they've lived in their own little world mm. to be able to achieve this great thing. And then they're trying to emerge into the, the big world and they think, oh, I don't want to, well, if that guy thinks this about me, but my friend from school now, yeah. uh, all this crap. And I, I said this actually today already once, so, but it doesn't matter. Like when you die, which is going to happen, there's, there's, there's a friend of mine, he, he says, memento more, which is like a, a soldier's phrase, but it means like, you're going to die. It's going to happen. It's coming up. Remember that you're going to die because when you die, none of these people are going to care about you. So you have to, even your best, even you two, great friends, run a business together, everything. When you die, he's going to come to your funeral. He's going to say, oh, had a, he was a great guy. Duh, 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 duh. Yeah, it was amazing. Then they're going to get in the car. Phone's going to go. Bills are going to be need to be paid. Business is going to need to run and you're going to forget. And it's, it's human nature. It's what happens. So why should I listen to some guy that as soon as I die, he's not gonna he's not, he's not gonna give me a second thought. And that is reality for ninety-nine percent of the people on the planet. Okay, your mum, if you die, she's gonna care. Your kids, they're gonna care and they're gonna remember you forever. And yeah, your best mate will every, when you're at a certain place, you might have a flashback or having a drink. But day on, day out, they're not gonna care. So why are you living your life by someone else's standards who once he dies, he or once you die, he's not even gonna give a shit. It doesn't make sense. But people put all this pressure on themselves like i have to impress this person i have to do this I have to do this and it's like once you understand that and you get the clarity that your life is your life and you're gonna die so get on with it, it i think it really wakes people up mm. yeah it's so, yeah it's such a, no it's true though mate. it's fucking it's so true because so many people are like that and they, they don't do things because of judgment fear of judgment is so mm. fucking big and in most of the time the people that you fear judgment of are fucking bumps it's so weird to say that. Isn't it? Especially you, you guys, can... you guys now, sorry to interrupt. Sorry? I know I like to talk, so it's... Yes, <laughs> mate. <laughs> the prerogative, man, yeah. do it. It's, uh, it's massive in the YouTube space or in yeah. the podcasting mm-hmm. space or in the Instagram space or Facebook or whatever. Like the, you, again, the amount of successful people I know, even from fighting, forget what I'm doing now, but when I was a fighter and I was hanging around with all these celebrity fighters mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff, no one, I remember this with my wife. We were in San Diego. I used to train at Alliance with a guy called Phil Davis. He was a Bellator champion, amazing fighter. And he was do, doing better than us, if you want to put it that way. Financially, he was a champion, all, all these sort of things. And my mates back home at school, I was living in San Diego in California. I was going to all these nice places, going on holidays, doing, you know, doing all these luxurious things. And when I'd meet them, They'd be like, oh, how's things? We're like, yeah, it's all right. I've just been to Cancun. I just did this. I just did that. They'd be like, all right, mate. Trying to show off. And I'd be like, no, bro. This is just my life. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to show off. Mm-hmm. But then when I said those things to Phil, yeah. he'd be like, oh, that's awesome, bro. I'm going to go here and I'm going to do that. And I'm planning to go to Japan. And, and you'd have this. What I'm saying is the guy above you on the ladder mm-hmm. is never going to say, all right, mate, chill out. Mm-hmm. Ooh, ooh, I'm never going to give you hate. It's always the guy yeah. below you, even on, on like a small level like that. So when you go on YouTube, mm-hmm. I mean, YouTube's great, and uh, luckily I haven't. The only comments I ever get on YouTube is that I got big ears. It's literally it. They're my favorite one, my favorite one, <laughs> uh, negative ones. I'm yeah. saying my favorite one is uh, hit that guy can hear can hear colors. That's my favorite. One. <laughs> it's, it's, decent. it's actually good. It's good. It's good. Yeah. I bet that guy can hear colors. So someone said, uh, "Oh, no wonder this guy's rich. I think he can hear the financial markets." Like, <laughs> I like that one as well. But it was. Um, but it's so funny that people are willing to sit there and type those things That's and like crazy, insult yeah. some guy that they don't know, or they believe it's an insult. They don't realize I called my podcast all ears, and I'm extremely proud of the fact that I've got cauliflower ears because I gave my whole life to fighting. Yeah, so I, I can't wait for mine, mate. <laughs> so, yeah. You're a guy, <laughs> mate. You're never getting any. Fun. Yeah. But you, you literally, you literally. Are, are bringing up the thing that I'm the proudest of. It's so strange, but they yeah. think it's an insult. And I'm just sitting there. It just, to me, it gets annoying because I'm like, okay, I get it. I got big ears. Yeah. Can we, could, is there any more context? Is there yeah, anything yeah. else you want to say? Because I think a lot of the time, some, so something that's super important, I think, is sometimes the negativity and the things that people say. Mm. If they're true, you sort it out. You know what I mean? Like if someone's going to go in there and go, like, Someone said to me this, which I think is super valuable for anyone in the YouTube space, anyone who wants to start a personal brand, is like, if you're fat, they're going to call you fat. Mm -hmm. If you're ugly, they're going to call you ugly. If you're dumb, they're going to call you dumb. So don't forget that the things that they're saying to you, if they are true, the best thing you do is sort them out. 
So it's like, don't get upset with some guy that you don't know calling you fat. Think, well, I'm fat. I should probably get into shape. So having a personal brand and putting yourself out on the internet, use all of the comments and the feedback as a motivation to be the best version of yourself. Mm. I think you own it as well a little bit. You know what I mean? Getting all hurt about it and that. Yeah, yeah, but, I mean? but, like, but, this is, but this is what a lot of people do. They, yeah, they own it. Hurt. You're right. But they, no, 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 they get hurt too. But I'm saying a lot of people, they'll ignore it. And they'll be like, oh, they're just haters. Yeah, but if the haters got a point, yeah. like change it. Mm. So, 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 so that's why I find a lot of guys, they're like, oh, I don't look at the comments because I read every comment because I want to see the positive and I want to see the negative. And if someone's saying, you sound dumb here, mate, and like, I go back and I watch that bit. Yeah. Like, okay, that guy's just talking shit. Or I know it was that I didn't quite, because sometimes I'll say like, uh, oh, this study, I can't remember the name of it, but you guys know, because I should have researched it before. I did it recently yeah. with, um, you were talking about having a monster for breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, with the, there's a molecule in your brain that they call sleep pressure. It's okay. called adenosine. Right? And I couldn't remember adenosine because I've been hitting the head a lot and sometimes my brain doesn't work. And I was sitting on this thing trying to do it to camera piece talking about the adenosine molecule. And I was like, uh, that molecule in your brain, uh, you can look it up. It's fine. <laughs> so if someone watches that video and they say, oh, great. Well, they're right. They're not wrong. You know, yeah. I feel like a lot of people, they try and brush off haters and negative comments. But I think embracing it, is, like you said, embracing it is good if you take a positive and the negative. It's self-development, isn't it? That's what you're encouraging is self-development. You you get being on a platform like this, you're lucky in a way that you've got people fucking judging you. Yeah. Because most people don't have that, you know, because they never get off their fucking sofa. Yeah. I feel like it's it, uh, we're gonna keep beating this drum, mate, as I'm sure you're fine with, but the jujitsu thing again. I, I feel that's something that it gives you because I think not many people are like thick skinned enough and have maybe sort of been called out enough to be able to accept negative feedback or even constructive criticism. Yeah. Whereas in jujitsu, like physically, if you're not good bad than somebody else you just get tapped out <laughs> so that every single time you're reminded that you're, you're not incompetent or yeah, you're, you're not as good efficient yeah. so i think it gives it it gives it you massively um going back to the fighting thing with the entrepreneurs um obviously tate had this this hit piece done in by vice but it was around the war room event which was where they got the guys in and kind of sprung the event on them what was that reaction like because obviously we sure saw that version which is probably bullshit almost certainly bullshit um, but <laughs> yeah. but when you because I think you were like the technical director right or the fight director or whatever take called it at the time yeah, 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 but you were involved I was I was deeply involved yeah yeah so th this for me was the most powerful thing that I've ever seen like, yeah like the vice I'm really thing. fascinated by it mate as yeah. a concept so I'm mean, obviously mainstream media lame like vice bullshit they don't want to give them any time whatever losers and they're, they, they're, it's happening I think they're selling out now or whatever they're going bust or something uh, like, like, they, they, they don't even know what they're doing <laughs> so the guy who did the um, documentary or whatever you want to call it he actually left because he got fired I think or whatever happened to him and then he started working with the BBC and they tried to redo another one and it failed it's embarrassing absolutely embarrassing but um, the concept I remember like sitting there because the, basically what it was it was an event within the war room where you would you paid for the event and it was called uh, the test mm. and no one knew what it was and you weren't told what it was you just have, you, told, have you seen this but no no like, I'm, like, I'm fucking you were told to prepare mentally prepare physically prepare every way you can prepare because you don't know what's going to happen and I, I i didn't even know what it was at the time so i went uh, to, to the house like before the event was happening and to win and he told me the concept and i was like Phew bro like what are you doing <laughs> you know and he was like no try. he said to me trust me it's going to be a transformative experience for everyone involved so the idea was that you show up to this event big event i think there was like there was a hundred plus people there and he gets up there and he says right guys uh in two days you're going to have a professional cage fight on romanian television here in this venue against a professional athlete right we we've all matched up everyone so all you gotta do is they're gonna give you a piece of paper and you have to say yes or no. Yes, I'm gonna have to fight. Or no, I told you to prepare for anything. I'm 35 years old, I've been on this, I think he was 36 or whatever. <laughs> I've been on this planet. As long as you have, I'm completely prepared and I've done it, I've taken short notice, last minute fights, blah, blah, blah. I do you wanna do it? And then people would say yes or they would say no, right? And they would hand in the ballots. And then it was my, he gave people an hour, I think, to make the decision. And there was a few of us in there, it was our job to persuade people not to do it. Interesting, okay. So the idea was that even if you had decided that you wanted to do it, we were like the outside pressure that we're going to make you change your mind and not do it. 
So again, we were talking earlier about trying to achieve something in your life. If you're trying to push for something and do something massive with your life and some hater comes along, you're like, you can't do that, bro. Don't do that. If you're going to listen to these negative naysayers in your life, you're never going to achieve anything. That's what the message was about. That was my job. For me, it's like, bro, I'm an ex-UFC fighter. If I tell them not to fight, they're not going to fight. So, you know, it's, it's, I put the pressure high, you know? Um, and I and this is what was my... Um, what was you saying to them? Like, well, my line was... No, 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 no. Yeah. I had like a... <laughs> I got like 40 people all this like I was like giving a speech almost about it and I just said because it was my job to convince them not to do it I was like you know I, I, I could accept if it, I was saying if it was me if it was I had to make the decision yes or no because this was just during COVID or just after COVID I can't remember and I was like you know if it was me I'd be okay with it except for the fact that he said they're going to be Russian fighters <laughs> <laughs> and uh and you know these guys haven't been able to compete yeah okay they're, they're going to know the deal but they're going to they're going to be looking for highlight reels for their Instagram like a star. I, I wouldn't do it I don't think I would do it and when that and I had one of my friends he said when you said you weren't going to do it I knew it was bullshit so because <laughs> he knows me he's like you would do anything yeah, yeah. so I was like okay um, but that was like my play like the Russian fire thing and then so then we whittled them down and then the guy there was an amazing amount of people that did it and the people that said no they got like this is why it worked because it sounds even like me trying to explain it I don't know if I should even go into the details I'm going into but screw it I'll be fine um, the reason it worked was the talks and the speeches and the moments afterwards so everyone who said no we, we brought them all into a room and we went through them one by one and we asked for their excuse she said why didn't you do it stand up what's your name say your name tell me why you didn't do it and they all had very similar Oh, I, I wasn't prepared to fight a professional fighter. I, a lot of them have been training. Like, a lot of them train. Did anyone just be honest and be like, oh, I'm scared? Yeah, a few. People say a few, that. a few, I've a few. I've got a bit of respect for that. If they yeah. go up and go, you know, I'm just fucking... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah but the whole ideology of it is that if we need to go to war, you're going to pussy out, yeah, yeah. right? So that's the whole thing about it. So anyway, everyone gets up bit by bit by bit. And the bit that was magic that you will never see on a Vice documentary, you'll never really see. Uh, and, I, and me, even me sitting there, I was like, we spoke about people not being able to deal with criticism, right? Mm. And Tate is so dead, like, on the money with his feedback and brutal to these guys, like, brutal. And I was like, oh, like, I, I can't. I, I just remember the feeling that I had, like, in my gut, like, oh. Because he basically said that he was embarrassed to know them because they said, like, they got to think, these are almost like super fans of mm. Tate. They're not, but they're in the war room. They're entrepreneurs. They're making money. They're very very um successful in their own right in their own fields they've spent this money they've flown to romania they've done all the even taken all these steps to then be told they're gonna and he said and then the guy oh, i'm embarrassed to know you you know like it, it, there was more to it than that mm. and he gives this long speech and that's why it worked because of the words that he said and how he the it was like honestly it was incredible to see and all these guys they they, they felt the shame yeah, you know? they must have really fucking reflected on yeah, yeah. Like and then he said right and this, it sounds like he's talking to children but he said right get a notepad sit in the corner and he made them all face the wall so they couldn't see anything and they had to write a letter to themselves about how they fell and everything else um, and I, there was maybe like 40 of them I, I can't remember then the other guys had to fight everyone lost first round I commentated on it got drunk with Tristan it was brilliant um, <laughs> And everyone lost, but they all tried. They all went in there and they give, they give everything and they were celebrated and they were whatever. Um, but the transformation that the guys that said no since that day have had is like insane mm -hmm. because they now take on more challenges. They push themselves further. They, and they feel that shame, you know, and, and, and the whole exercise, the whole idea behind it was that was like the guys that say yes are going to get the, are going to get the, adrenaline rush of having a fight and fighting a pro and getting beaten up and then all the things that we understand because we do it but these guys don't get it and then the guys that said no they had this this real magical moment with with a very very influential guy especially in their eyes he just would have changed the whole like mm. realities and i think that's not spoken about and it's non-purpose i like a, we don't really talk about the events that happen inside mm. the war room unless you're inside but I think now it's been enough time and, and, and with the Vice documentary and all these things, the amount of positivity that came out of that event and to how it changed people's lives and people have written, because, because within it we have halls where you talk about like your, well, they've written about the positive impact it's had on their life is like, you'll never hear about that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to share how, how, 
how positively it impacted them. And then also, forget all that. Forget everything I just said. And now think you're in a bar with a random dude that you never met before. And what is the currency of men that don't know each other and get to know each other? The currency is stories and talking to each other. Why do you think some guy's interested and some guy's not interested? Is the stories he can tell. Why do you want to be around someone and not around other people? Because of the experiences that he's had in his life. Men are all about what they've experienced. And if you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I've got this crazy story, and he tells this crazy story, and you're like, well, I've got a pretty crazy story. I flew to <laughs> Romania, and I had a professional case file on television uh, on two days' notice in the mountains in Transylvania, what did you do last week? Well, yeah, I was with my mom and I watched Netflix. So, yeah, like the, the experience <laughs> yeah, they got from it. Mental. And, and it, it, it literally is mental. Yeah, so mental. they have this story for the rest of their lives that they can talk about how they're feeling, how they're like, you got, you went into a cage fight with a professional fighter. How did you feel? And they can talk about it. And, they, and they, those moments you can reflect on forever. So that those people will remember that weekend for the rest of their lives because mm -hmm. some of them have had fights since mm -hmm. and I've facilitated that for a few people as well but some people who haven't had fights that'll be the only time they ever feel combat ever because the world's yeah. so safe so they will that that fear that they felt in that moment will live with them forever and I think that's yeah, it's incredible and again I believe every man should fight I think every man should fight three times I think the first time you fight you're just doing it for whatever you're doing it for. You don't really understand it. You don't know how it feels. You're st if you watch my first ever fight, I'm like, like deer and head nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah deer and <laughs> head nice, right? But you got you do it. Yeah. You take the leap. Second one, you get a little bit more, and then the third one, you almost become competent. Mm -hmm. Three amateur fights, you almost become competent. I'm not saying you are. It depends on the level, how much you give to it. But if you give everything to three fights, I believe you can call yourself a man that fights. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and you got to win one, at least. Yeah. You go in there and you get yeah. smashed three Last times. I can take way more than three fights for some fucking people, can't you? <laughs> but yeah, so I think that... that, that it, Man, that's fucking incredible, though. It's like, a crazy You've story. got that many people, like, in a place, not knowing anything they're doing. You know mm -hmm. I mean, it... it Something completely different, but it reminds me in America where people pay to fucking be tortured. Have you ever seen that? Oh, yeah. They fucking take him into the woods and this fucking <laughs> bloke basically fucking locks him in a haunted house that he's created and he, he literally tortures them. But oh, I thought you were on about, I thought you were about some like kinky shit, mate. No, <laughs> like, that's an air. Nah, 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 like, nah, literally just fucking <laughs> yeah. pulls teeth out and shit. Like, oh, really fucked up. Wow. But again, if the people are signing up to yeah. something though, that they have no clue what it is, that takes balls at the start, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, whether you're rich, poor, whatever, but if she said to me, like, fucking that you'd have to really fucking think about it let alone fucking pay for it yeah, yeah, yeah you know, fair play to them like yeah. fucking yeah crazy yeah it's amazing. mad mate it's, it's, it's reproducing it's impossible that's the thing it, never, it can never be done again no, it's amazing mm -hmm. mate. because it's everyone's going to kind of know what it is yeah. it just can never happen again mm -hmm. so that weekend that happened for those like it's a one in a lifetime thing mm -hmm. so yeah, it's amazing fucking amazing yeah it's fascinating for you personally mate in your fighting career you've talked a lot about your sort of systems and obviously we're aware of your successes and the, the level you got to what was your lowest point in fighting, whether it was like, you know, a, a fight itself or just where your head was at? And how did you overcome that? Hmm. Okay. Like my lowest, like I would say, everyone would think that it was when I left the UFC, but I was extremely proud of that. Uh, what happened with me, I, I had like nine fights under contract, including the Alma fight. My last fight was against a guy called Mark Munoz mm -hmm. in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, I was supposed to fight a guy called Clint Hester and he pulled out because of injury. And I knew that there was a Philippine a, a card happening in Manila in the Philippines, and I, I and I in my head I thought if I beat Mark Munoz I'm an, I'm I'm established fighter for the rest of my life. So I took on that challenge and I asked for it, uh, and I went three rounds with Munoz and I got battered by I you know giving everything. So as long as I give everything I'm happy. I wasn't I'm, I never watched the fight back to be honest, but I um, you know I'm, I'm proud of that moment and everything else. And then I left the UFC, lost my visa. There was a few different things that happened. That was tough, but that wasn't the, the, the lowest. I think the lowest point for me, which is now when I look back at it, is when I should have retired, is uh, after that fight, I went on a five-fight win streak um, back in the UK. I fought in Italy for a show called Benator. I became their middleweight champion. I defended that belt, fought in the UK, and I did a few different bits. And then I fought in Romania, actually, um, which is another story. And I had a fight. I was commentating for a Russian company called ACB at the time, now called ACA, but it was called ACB. And I was commentating with them and they offered me a fight against, uh, I can't say his name now, Mamed Kalidov. 
So that for me, I fight against Mamma Kalida. But at the time, he was ranked seventh in the world. Um, and at the same time I offered this fight, I got contacted by the UFC and they wanted to re-sign me. So I could have returned to the UFC. Um, and the way I looked at it at that moment in time was if I went back to the UFC, I would need to have three, four, maybe five wins to even get anywhere near the top 10. Or I could just go for the shortcut and I could beat Mamek Kalidov and I could re-sign the UFC on big money as a top 10 fighter. So as I described myself in the gym with Lee Dosky, I always try and look for the biggest challenge. And, and for me to fight Mamek Kalidov was like a dream. I don't know if anyone knows him, but he he's like outside the UFC, he's the biggest name in Europe ever. Like he's Chechnyan, but grew up in Poland or lives in Poland, an amazing fighter. Uh, he's KSW middleweight champion for a very, very long time. And, and he's a great, a great guy as well. Um, but to me, that was like, that, that was such a big moment for me. So I trained, I think it was like three and a half months, like an absolute madman, like the most dedicated I've ever been, the hardest I've ever worked, everything, like no stone unturned, give it everything, didn't see my family, didn't, I was just like, <laughs> like on it, like convinced I was going to win this fight. Like to this day, I still think I should have won the fight, right? So... It was in Manchester Arena. It's a stone's throw away for me. I've had two fights in Manchester Arena. One was against Andrew Craig, Craig for the UFC. I got performance of the night, won 50 bags, and, and, and I dropped him twice and choked him unconscious. It was probably the best performance of my career. And one was this fight. Um, and in this fight, I'd not fought in the UK for a while because I'd been uh, in the UFC, Philippines. Uh, the last time I fought in the UK was against Andrew Craig. So it was like five years or four years. Um, I moved about 300 tickets. My family were in the audience. My wife's family were in the audience. All my mates were in the audience. It was like big, big night, main event, Manchester Arena. And I got knocked down in 21 seconds. And getting knocked down in 21 seconds, I don't even, it's funny because I don't even remember the punch. And in my head, I got hit, fell down, and I was unconscious, and I was out like a proper video game knockout. That's how I felt. Watched the fight back. I got hit, stunned up, was standing up, carried on standing, got hit about five more times, dropped down, got hit, got hit, got hit. So I was unconscious on my feet uh, and got knocked out. That, when I went back into the change rooms after that fight and everything that I'd sacrificed, given up a UFC contract to, to take the fight, my whole three months or a little bit longer of my life given to that. I felt like it was the the moment for me, you know, like I built up to be the, the, the storytelling moment for me. Would return back to the UFC, which no other, you at that time, no other UK fighter had ever left the UFC and gone back to the UFC. Mm -hmm. They were yeah. like in and out. Um, so that was something that I really wanted to achieve. And I just remember breaking down uh, out, out of the back. And then I got, got in a taxi afterwards with my wife, and whatever. But it was... Uh, Crazy moment for me, a like crazy, crazy hard time. And I now look back at it and think that's when I should have retired mm. because I had about 10, 11 fights after that fight and I never truly gave it everything ever again mm. because I like, it's like when your heart gets broken for the first time and the next time you meet a bird, you're like, all right, maybe I won't, maybe I won't yeah. wear my heart on my sleeve and tell her that I love her straight away because it's going to end, end badly. You know, you learn from yeah. those experiences. This was the time where I... I gave it, like I gave it my whole soul to this fight and I got knocked down 21 seconds and it broke me. So I never, I trained hard for the rest of my fights and I, I had up and, up and down career, like win, loss, win, fall all over the world. It was great, great experiences. But that moment was, uh, yeah, that's when I should have, I, looking back here now, I, there was nothing to gain from, from that moment onwards. After I lost that fight, there was no reason to have another 10, just brain damage. Um, and that, when you say about getting over it, I don't think I ever did for uh, in the in the fighting world. I think that was the one that did me. And, and I know that's not the inspirational story maybe that you're looking for, but I think that's when I knew it was time. Yeah. That's when I realized that, I, well, I didn't at the time, but later on, because I thought, oh, I'll get back there. Uh, moving forward, always moving forward, moving forward, because that's how my brain works. Um, but now looking back at it, that's when I should have given up. And it took me probably another six fights to realize that I didn't really care anymore. And that's why, uh, how I look at fighting for me is if I am not competing against the Mamed Khalidov, it means nothing. You know, so it's like, if you were gonna say, you said, okay, you can fight John Jones in six months, I'm in, 
I'm going to train like a madman and I'm going to give that guy everything. Yeah. I'm not saying I'm going to win, but I'm going to give him everything. And if I beat that man, it means something to me. But after losing to Khalidov, I, 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 I've probably won another five, six fights. I couldn't tell you who they are. I couldn't care less. None of it mean anything. When I won, I felt nothing. You're just like, yeah, okay, of course I'm going to beat this guy. Mm. Yeah. I should be fighting these guys. That's how I felt about it. And I knew the road was so long to get back to fight these, this level of opportunity, of, of opponent. Mm. And they were still dangerous fights. I lost a couple and, and whatever else. Um, and I think that's why I kind of not fell out of love, but I just, I just, there was no, nothing in it for me. There was no juice anymore. And that's something, like I said, I'm going gonna, gonna to find the, like I fought Sean Strickland in the UFC. Now he's a middleweight champion. Well, I want to ask about I'll have, that, I'll have that rematch any day of the week. Yeah. And that, that would mean something. Yeah. Do you think you but, would end up where he's ended up? Uh, well, Sean, I think I've trained with him a lot since, and in the training, he's formidable, like unbelievable guy. Yeah, yeah. And like looking at his fights before, Merkel, maybe not character, he's got all those sort of things, but he's a great example. He's kind of like a Michael Bisbee, he's never made, but, no, but he, he mental, like, yeah. he's mental in many different ways. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not like we had our fight, I lost a split decision, but definitely won the fight. Sean will agree, I won the fight, but I've trained with him since. And he bad me, you know, like a, a, he has developed so much. I think he, when we fought, I was 26, he was 23. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's like three years younger than yeah. me. So he must be 32, 33. And uh, he just, he just, again, had that clarity of purpose, continued, 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 continued. I was on a free fight win streak when I beat, uh, when I fought him in the UFC. So beating him, I would have been on a four fight win streak in the middleweight division. I think I was around 20th in the world at that point. So it was like, it was a real moment for my career. If I'd have won, I would have moved forward. But Everything always works out in the end, and, and my life's pretty great. He's got, he's become middleweight champion, which I mean, if he can retain that title, then I'm um, good on him. Mm -hmm. uh, I think his his views on some, certain things are quite funny. I think he's playing a bit of a character. He's doing the right thing. Um, I was about to say, is he actually like that, or is it? Is he, it is, he is. He is like that. Yeah. <laughs> but he comes across like he's like that. But he's turning the volume up a little bit, yeah. like everyone is. But he is like that. He is. He. De but he's definitely understands what he's doing um and like i said in the now we're going to see him fight hamza right so mm -hmm. i used to train with hamza quite a lot as well so uh, like that fight's going to be great and they train together at um wherever the gym is in vegas i'm trying to remember them at extreme couture they've done quite a bit of training together and um you know sean sean's the great because he's like the blue collar working man who achieved it, achieved his dreams mm -hmm. you know good on it i but when i fought him back in berlin he like he showed up wearing a World War II hat. Like, <laughs> Did he? He was, he was an, American, an American invading Germany. And he, uh, yeah, he thought I was some like posh kid. Mm. I was like, I'm, I'm not. I might talk. <laughs> you do sound like it, yeah. I was gonna say, you do sound like it. But that's, that's my mum. My mum always had proud, uh, pride in me expressing myself and talking in a certain way because my mum always wanted to be posh. Yeah. You know what I mean? She always mm -hmm. wishes that yeah. she was posh. She's not. She's from the East End of London. Trust me, she's from West End. She's, she's not. Right, but she would always. Yeah. She always believes that the way you project yourself is what you're going to get back from the world, and she taught me that as well. And I'm super thankful that she. Mm -hmm. My mum did so much for me in that way, but that and she'd always. You know those parents that are like you don't say it like that, you say it like this. Mm -hmm. That's my mum, you know. And and, and it was that's my missus. <laughs> <laughs> it would do my head in, but it paid me complete yeah. dividend. Um, and yeah, I, I think it definitely adds to to my life so yeah we're well, uh, doing your doing your good work now mate isn't it so it's all good um you mentioned that sean scripture was like just a normal working class bloke i wanted to kind of segue into that a little bit because we talked about the lot of people you work with are entrepreneurs and are already quite successful in their own right this podcast primarily as much as we're always on about sort of fighting and jujitsu it's because what we're passionate about but it's it's really aimed towards i guess men's mental health and, and lifestyle as well obviously in the uk suicide is probably the way well, it's the biggest killer in the men under 45 um, and I'm just curious to see from your perspective, like what you think's going on there. And, you know, it, I, I don't know, I don't know what the stats are around whether that's kind of like, you know, whether it's a poverty thing or, or but it yeah. feels like it's guys that just haven't got anything fucking going on. You talk about purpose already, but what are your thoughts on, on that statistic and, and what's going wrong with men? I mean, it's a huge topic. And I think that's one of the reasons I got into YouTube as well, because I think giving away free information and free insight can help so many people. And it is free, but I don't think it's a, a financial thing. I think a lot of the, I think what most people don't understand is most men, when it comes to romantic relationships, 90% of men, they don't get a single bit of attention from a female ever in their whole life. Literally, 
I think that, that that's such an underrated thing. Mm. Now with the the whole Instagram lifestyle and, you know, I saw something that made me, made me I don't know if you understand about crypto, and uh, but they talk about cycles and they talk about like um, a sell signal, if you know what that is. Like if you, it's like, all right, so it's like, when you uh, a cycle tops, you start getting sell signals. Like, okay, we should sell. And one of the sell signals is like when your grandmother knows about crypto. Hmm. So your grand says, oh, I was thinking about buying this crypto. All right, I should sell because <laughs> it's all going to go to shit, yeah. right? And one of the, 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 the people said about the economy, they said the biggest sell cycle uh, s- signal about the economy right now is that fours and fives just want a man that's got six, that earns six figures. And so there's a there's a bird out there who's a five out of 10 and they should only sell for a guy as long as he's making over six figures a year. That's like a sell signal. That's like the economy's fucked. Mm-hmm. We are like, the, the, the women now, I, I don't know if you've ever seen Fresh and Fit, that podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I can't believe that. They feel, they feel like paid actors, mate. No, I know, but they're just, like, I, I, trust me, I've been, me, I've been to Miami, that is what it's like. Fucking <laughs> they, 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 do well fucking. In, they do well at selecting the couch, but that is what, I know Myron and the boys there and they, yeah. they do a great job, but that to me shows the, like the mentality now that we have of men and women. So women are what, they, 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 I said this uh, recently, I tweeted this, right? And it says like, every woman on the planet will say this. Now, I know my worth, I know my worth. If you're worthless, you're worthless. You, knowing your worth has got to be both ways. You've got to create worth. Yeah, exactly. Women believe they are worth something. They believe they have worth. Oh, I know my worth. I'm not going to settle for less than this. Like, why? Why do you think you deserve that when you are just some average person? You know, not talking about looks, not talking about but, but average intelligence, average care, average, everything. If you're not going to give extra, why do you deserve extra? But women have so entitled in this day and age that they believe they deserve everything because the world is giving it to them. Whereas men are getting left behind mm-hmm. because men are being told that they can't be like that. They are being they are being told that it's the complete opposite. Like men are shit. Don't be manly. Don't be like this. Be more like this. Be more like this. And that consistent, you know destruction of uh, being a man and what it's about you know i think that's the issue that's the problem that we're being pushed down over and over again and it's like i think now we talk about sean strickland because sean strickland i think he's a good example for a lot of guys to talk he talks about being a man there's a lot of good things about sean like with some of his mentality and what he talks about um because he he just kept he knew what he wanted and he went after it over and over and over and over and over again and he that is what being a man is being a man is going through the shit to get the reward like that's what you have to do and i think most men now are so afraid of going through the shit they don't want to so they don't achieve anything and when they don't achieve anything they're just stuck and think oh life's so hard i can't do anything and it's got nothing to do with finance it's all to do with my it's the easiest thing to 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 look at money like oh he's low income but the only reason he's low income is because of his mentality sucks Mm -hmm. his mentality towards money his mentality towards women his mentality towards physical health like to generate money now has never been so easy. It's literally never been so easy to make money. Literally, in, in the whole of human history, it's never been easier to make money. So money is not the problem. There is, like we always say, there's money flowing in the sky. You just got to learn how to grab it. Like there's money everywhere. So if you don't know how to make money, it's your fault. And the problem is that men aren't taking accountability for who they are, which is a female trait. It's okay for women not to take accountability because the man will sort things out traditionally, you know, whatever. But men now are not taking accountability for who they are. They're not doing what we just discussed. When you go to jujitsu and you get choked out, you think, why did I get choked out? Oh, because I did. Uh, why did I grab my lapel? When, uh, and you, you reanalyze your life. If you're not reanalyzing your life and you're just living day to day, of course you're going to end up a loser because you've got no direction. You haven't plotted a course. You haven't set things out. So I think the reason male suicide is so high, it's got nothing to do with women. Like they're, 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 That's like the end. Like Again, what with goal saying... People always think about the result. They always think about the end thing. Like, okay, I want to be a millionaire. Okay, bro. You want to be a millionaire. How are you going to become a millionaire? <laughs> think about it. Break it down. Think of the steps and think about what you're going to do today that's going to make you a millionaire. They, they, but they just focus on the money or the whatever. And that is, is, is the issue now. Everyone sees the goal, but they don't see the hard work it takes to get to the goal, right? And it's the same with mentality. People now, they don't believe, they, they, don't, they can't make the connection between the two. And they don't focus on their day-to-day actions to be able to get the, the thing. So that's why I think they become weaker. I think that's why they become 
distracted. I think that's why they start watching porn. I think that's why they, 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 they and OnlyFans is skyrocketing through the roof because men can't make connection with women anymore mm. because they're too afraid to go up and say hello. Mm. It's not that difficult, you know, mm. but women aren't the problem. It's the, the self-confidence of the man and the, the intention of the, behind the man to become, to, to improve and to take accountability for who he is. Yeah. I feel like there's, there's potentially two cohorts of men that maybe struggle with, with mindset, mood, and depression, mm. everything else. You've got the people you just mentioned, the guys that can't even get a bird maybe a little bit younger then you might have a, a cohort of guys that are maybe a bit older and married are kind of tied into a mortgage bills kids and they're kind of stuck um and there's something a previous guest talked about where you know they don't want to maybe express themselves to their other half because they don't want to mm-hmm. ever lose her they will talk to their mates and they become a bit of an emotional island like to, to that guy who's you know maybe has the some level of female connection, but is kind of locked in because of financial commitments and family commitments. What can that guy do, do you think? I think you, you touched on it because you said, I, don't, I, I believe as a man, you used to call him an emotional island. Mm. I think this has been twisted. And having an emotional connection with, with your woman is extremely important. But that doesn't mean you, you want to cry to her with your problems. She, you are the rock. You are the guy that she's looking at for support. So if you go to her and say, oh, I'm really struggling with this, that, that I, I believe that, that that never leads to a healthy relationship. But what you need is you need brothers. You need people that you can discuss things with. And you can go to and say, listen, this is happening, but I feel that what are you doing with this? And that's something that women do very, very well. They talk to each other, but men are kind of seem like, you can't, I don't want to be embarrassed. So that embarrassment factor is gone. You need to find people that you trust. You need to have a circle of people that can, can like you can go to with your issues because if you can't go to and you only have yourself to i mean i, I completely 100 percent rely on myself 100 percent, and i take every bit of stress in my life i take it all on but if i'm struggling with something and i have an issue i'll talk to a friend and i'll say listen i went through this and da, 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 da. and I, I think they call it frame this red pool community so i'm not into the red pill stuff and all these people get it conflated and confused with some of the the messages that i send out but it's like if you are a man and you are, uh, have you decided to get into a relationship with a woman and you have decided to have that frame, and we talk about um, like the imprint that you put in the relationship, this is the thing that you're basically saying. Guys met a girl, they've grown up together, they've had kids together, they're, they're now they're, they're here. The, the girl will always look at that guy as when she met him. She'll always remember that guy as when she met him because that's when they made the biggest imprint and impression on that person. Then what women do is they're going to slowly test that man to make sure that he's what he says he is. You told me you could do this. So I'm going to test you every single day to make sure you can still do it. Because biologically, I need to know that you can look after me. If you can't look after me, then what are we doing together? So he'll, be t- he'll get tested over and over. And if he breaks down, the woman will lose respect for the man, in my opinion. So that's where the man needs to never break down to the woman and ma- maintain this Control, control is the wrong word, but control over himself in the relationship. So he's not breaking down emotionally. She can come to him with the problems and he can solve the problems. Men are built to solve problems. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the only thing we want to do yeah. as a man. Mm-hmm. I always say, like, I feel the only thing I want is respect. And I want to be respected by my woman and I want her to come to me with problems and I want to solve them for her. I am a problem solver. Women don't want that when you're on connection. They come to you with a problem. You solve the problem. And they're like, I didn't want that. I just want you to. So, okay, talk yeah. to the girls about that. And I think men not having the confidence, again, it comes down to confidence, to instruct or build the lanes of what the relationship is and to say, these are my roles, these are your roles, you complete your roles, I'll complete my roles, happy relationship. It's just like a business. Yeah. And that sounds like gay to put it like that. But if you're, you two have got certain roles in the business, if you're lagging on him, yeah. he's going to get pissed off. If you're lagging on him, he's going to And But most people don't even identify that. It's fucking accountability, isn't it? It's accountability. And what happens when you to way you talking about it you meet and you're individuals and then the the the, the lanes are clear then you have kids because i've got two kids i know what it's like your wife completely changes into a completely different person she now is a mother who has to protect these children and the whole relationship changes but you don't readdress the situation and you don't talk about what the priorities are Mm -hmm. and you need to talk about it and be clear that okay I mean, in the modern world, women work as well and they have to make money and all these sort of stuff. And if you're not a man that can provide at that level, in my opinion, that is your responsibility and you've got to work out how to do that. 
But if you're not in that situation, then maybe your, your wife has to work, but she shouldn't have to. She should be 100% focused on the kids, raising them, making them the best individuals that they can, caring for them, looking after them. And the man has to take on all of the other stress. That's how I would look at it. And I think that's traditional and, and how, and I think, can't believe that people disagree with that or get upset by that. It's, but if the roles are reversed, I've got friends that they're, they're like more dominant females and they, they have businesses and they run, then the man is, is the caregiver for the children. You need, to, you need to have the clear roles, right? I think it traditionally works the best, but in modern society, we have the other way around. So if you're a dominant woman and, you, and your man looks after the kids, great. You go out and you, you go hunt, you go make money, you go provide, and he has to give that care and that love to the kids. No problem with that, mm. whatever. But normally, generally, it's the other way around. Mm. So if the guy is willing to take all that pressure on and he sets the, the, the lanes, that's the, that's the most important thing. I think he's like saying, you do this, I do this. You let me do this, and then you can do whatever you want over here. You can be the best for, you're the When you're the best version of yourself and I'm the best version of myself, we get the best outcome. That is what a team is. That, mm. like they talk about quality and being equal. You're equal in the relationship, mm. but you have different roles. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I think that problem is not addressed. I think that's what gets blurred. It's the roles, isn't it? You know, they, people think like being masculine and taking on those roles is, you know, being misogynistic or being this or being that. And it's not, it's, it's, it's good to have roles and have clear, you know, we, we have our roles for this. So we, we do certain aspects of it. And, it, and if you stop blurring those lines a little bit, that's where it becomes fucking, but the, the bro, fucking it, odd. It becomes odd, but the problem is in real, in real life, in reality, when you're in a, in a couple and you have kids, everything gets blown out of the window. Like I, mm. trust me, when you have kids, like the whole thing changes, the whole dynamic changes and people don't readdress it. Mm. So when you don't readdress it because you're afraid, you don't want to upset her or you don't want to say something and she's gonna, yeah. And it's like that dynamic is not good enough. You need to clear that up and you need to be like, now this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And the person who needs to do that, in my opinion, is the leader of the relationship. If that's the man or the woman, in my opinion, it should be the man. The man should be there and go, these are the roles. Mm -hmm. You do this, I do this. And then you can adjust. And it's not like a, like a, you know, <laughs> I've said this yeah. in the sand stone, but you, you, you have to trial and try things and, and, and lead. You have mm -hmm. to be a leader. And we're not, as most men out there now, the average man is not built to be a leader. The average mm -hmm. man is built to be a follower. So they get lost. So my advice would be to reassess where you are in your life. Like you said, there, if you're, God forbid it, you're thinking about committing suicide and you've got kids. I mean, that, 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 to me, that's the weakest thing you could ever do on the planet, but it happens. And, I, and I'm not talking about depression. We talk about all this, these other things, but if you're in a situation where you have a family and you are, are, are upset or low or whatever, let's redefine your purpose in life and your purpose in life is going to be down to the relationship that you have with your family and your wife and if your wife is overbearing and your wife is nagging and it's your fault it's not her fault it's your fault that you've allowed her to get to a situation where she's even allowed to nag at you because you're not providing what you should be providing if you're in bed sleeping not doing what she should not nag at you she deserves to you know what i mean so I think the the problem is that we don't have enough strong men in the world that are willing to stand up and stand up for their beliefs and say what they think mm -hmm. because they're so worried about what everyone else is going to say and think about them. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to, they're so worried about approaching these subjects with their wife or with their girlfriend because they think they'll leave them. You know, yeah. and it's like, it's creating that worth though. And I find a lot of like middle-aged blokes, they let themselves go so far. So they get, they fucking, you know, fucking lose their hair, they get fat, they do this, they, they fucking get in this rut, they don't ever go out, they're eating shit all the time. And then their missus like turns around and looks at them when they're like 45 and thinks, fuck me. Yeah. Can't be asked for this fucker mm. anymore. Yeah. And I was explaining that to someone recently when they were saying that when, um, when, people, when people get depressed at certain points of their life, and it's usually because of a physical, like when they physically get really bad, but it, how many middle-aged blokes do that? It's ridiculous, isn't it? How many middle-aged blokes go to that point where they're so, so sh they fucking hate themselves, mate. They might have money, you know. They might have money, but they don't have their their their, their partner. Then isn't like finding them attractive. They can't get a fucking wank off them. You know what I mean? They can't get anything, and they're like, oh, they're not looking at me, not doing this because they're not looking after themselves. And it snowballs, then, doesn't it? Then then the wife's playing away, and then their fucking lives fall apart. Then they got you know they got to fucking pay this, pay that. They lose half their shit, and they go, oh yeah, she's left me for a bloke. But sometimes it always comes back to you no. Know, if you looked after yourself, if you want to, not sometimes, come, always. Yeah, 
Always. If you want a lazy cunt, if you weren't going to do this and you weren't going to do that, you know, she wouldn't have left you in the fucking first place if you was actually like taking ownership of your own shit, you know? And so many, so many people forget that, don't they? So many people are keen to go, oh, yeah, she's left me. Well, why has she fucking left you? Why has she done it? You know? I think, again, because just people talk about the result and the moment when mm. it happens, but when it happens, the problem was here. Mm. The problem mm. was so long ago. The problems to start when you did not redefine your roles or you did not do this, you didn't, like you said, what, how can you be a four-year-old man walking around like and, and being out of shape and not being healthy and not, it's like, we go back to what I said at the beginning, like the, the, the three things that are most important. First is your physical health. Mm. If you're taking care of who you are physically and mentally, that's number one. And it's so easy to it think. It tells a lot about yourself though, but it's, it? it's so easy to think that the money's more important because you've got to pay the bills, you've got to, but I guarantee a, a woman will respect you more if you cannot afford to, to, to keep the lifestyle that you keep, but you're in physical shape and you're doing all the other things that you're doing and you downgraded and you got a worse car and you didn't have a Rolex, you know, the, all, those things aren't important. Everyone thinks those are the important things. The important things are your physical and mental health. Mm -hmm. So if you're physic and, and the body and the mind work together. So if you're physically in shape, it's like such a big impact on the rest of your life. And like you said, the, the woman's going to find you attractive because if you're giving off that energy that other people are attracted to, she's going to be attracted to you. So it's like you have to have that. If you don't have the, your physical shape in in, in nope. way, that, I mean, I've, I've even gone there myself personally. The last three years when I gave up fighting, my life changed. I focused on different things. I started getting super out of shape. For me, like I was a professional athlete, 8% body fat, and I went to like 26%, like out of shape, like disgusting. Carry it well. Because I'm a six foot six monster, but <laughs> it, it just didn't really. I was so upset with myself, so I've had to readjust. If I didn't readjust and I didn't notice and I didn't identify that problem, in ten years I'll be a fat mess. My wife will leave me, and I'll be like, "Oh, why is she leaving me?" Because of ten years ago, I didn't. I didn't sort it out. Mm -hmm. So I think most of the problem, not most, all of the problems. Again, they come down to having you call it self worth, but I think yeah. it's identifying that you need. You are responsible for your own life, mm -hmm. and women genuinely will want something that other people want so if no one wants you and you're a fucking mess yeah then you know you're, if no one else wants you your wife ain't gonna want you you know what i mean and and i think like in any relationship again business whatever you want to call it but as long as you, you have the the best thing you can do for your relationship is be selfish be a hundred percent about yourself care more about yourself than anyone else because if you're happy you're going to be happy and bad to your wife you're going to be bad to your kids they're going to see a happy person you're going to raise them in a happy frame Every time you walk in the room, you're going to have the energy of, of fun and happiness. Your kids are going to gravitate to you. Or what. So it's all about you. If, you. if you're trying to please your woman and you're doing everything that she says and it makes you unhappy, it's never going to work. <laughs> yeah. It's never, ever going to work. But that's what people think. The man will be like, no, 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 I'm doing this for you. And she doesn't even want you to do that. She wants you yeah. to look after yourself. But she's testing. She's going, okay. Do this for me. Do that for me. She went, no, do it yourself. I'm focusing on this because I'm going out gathering and hunting and winning. You want to be with a winner, I'm a winner. Mm. But most people don't consider themselves winners. So when the girl says, can you do this for me? They go, okay. And, and, the, and the respect slowly goes away. They put on the weight or they do whatever they're doing. And then they find themselves in, in like you said, middle-aged, almost in a cage, mm. having to pay all the bills, stressed. Mm. Duh, 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 duh. And it's like, bro, if you just reassessed and thought about it and focused on yourself that would be the best thing you could do get yourself in shape get yourself mentally in a good place get yourself making better money to worry about you mm. by by and people use it as a scapegoat oh, i'm doing this for my family or i'm doing this for my wife no focus on yourself make yourself the best version of yourself and that will help your family yeah. as a byproduct yeah completely agree mate o on that you, you kind of went through those different components and the different attributes and then just touching on the money one, because definitely the economy at the moment and finances are definitely having a, a big impact on everyone's mental health, I think. And there'll be blokes watching this that have maybe got their health in order, they've maybe got good relationships, but they ain't got a fucking clue how to make money. And you've just mentioned that the money floats around and it's, it's easier now than ever to make money. But you've probably got, I don't know, a middle-aged bloke listening, he's been, mate, what are you fucking talking about? I've been in a job 10 years, <laughs> been working 50 hours a week, I'm still fucking skin. Like in regard to making money, like what's your opinion of, of what that guy could do in the easiest way to make money? You have to understand what skills you have and how you are leveraging those skills. So it's, uh, for me, it sounds like I'm repeating myself and it's everyone knows, but maybe they don't. I don't know. So I want to say it anyway, but if you are in, in the industry of trading your time to make money, you are never going to have money. 
You, you, there's not enough hours in the day where you can say, I'm a personal trainer, charge 30 pound an hour, 40 pound an hour, I'm gonna work 10 hours a day and I'm gonna make that money. You haven't got enough time, but if you can think of a way to leverage that so you can make more money by starting a business or by doing anything and you have to take the leaps and you have to take the, the, um, you know, the big steps and the risks, but maybe you gotta leave your job. Okay, you've been working, you just said 10 years, the same job and I'm broke. Sweet, that's a mistake. So you're doing the wrong thing. So quit. But no one will quit because I'm not going to do that. It's like, okay, so carry on doing the same thing for another 30 years and being broke. It's like never been easier to make money now because of the internet. Mm -hmm. And once you understand how to leverage and use the internet, there's the, there's, 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 what are those bloody videos that you see of those um, people doing TikToks where they get the nice donations or whatever? There's people making six, seven, eight grand a day. From, from from women like women sitting there they're like lick the screen and say mmm tasty have you seen that I've never <laughs> fucking seen that so it's fucking dreadful so I'm saying like you can go TikTok live yeah. and you can get donations of 50 cents if you get enough followers enough people they donate 50 cents you get a thousand people do that you make more money than you're going to make in a day working like it just the, what I'm trying to say that went off a little bit of a tangent but when you understand the, the skills that you have, that 10 years you've been doing your job, mm. whatever that job is, you need to learn how to leverage those skills to reach a wider audience. How do you reach a wider audience? The internet. The internet is how you reach a wider audience for everybody. You know, and if you want to become self-employed or you want to, you need to, you need to spend time focusing. This is how I look at it, all right? The, I'm that guy. I'm, I'm 35. Been, I've been working the same job for 15 years. I want to do something different. Obviously, just don't quit your job because you need to pay the bills. But now you need to not go out every, every, any weekend ever. Don't go on family holidays. Make all the sacrifices you need to make to save a bit of money. Do whatever. Start reading this unlimited information on the internet. Start training yourself. I, I got, I've been, I'm not trying to... But you can talk about the real world that has everything that you want to know about learning how to make money on the internet, which literally what it does, there's 18 wealth creation methods that you can learn for $49 a month. There is 18 different, uh, they have these like campuses, they're called, where you, you have limitless information about YouTube, limitless information about crypto, limitless information about every, every, everything you can think of that's on the internet, how to close, how to copyright, how to client acquisition, 50, 50 bucks a month. So if you haven't got 50 bucks a month, okay, don't go out and drink beer at the weekend, make those sacrifices, save up 50 quid, enroll for this every month and you can literally learn and educate yourself. The problem is people think education is over when you leave school mm -hmm. and you start a job. Learn about how to make money. Learn what money is. It's another big point. So you say, like, these guys don't know, do they even know what money is? Do you even understand what money is? Because money is not what you think it is. What is it? Fugazi. Uh, <laughs> Fugazi. <laughs> Fugazi. But you know, if you talk about money, like, I think it was 1941, they brought the US dollar off the gold standard, right? So it was like, 80 years ago, whenever it was, maybe my, my, again, when it comes to dates and years, it might be 74, I can't remember. But they take off the gold standard and, and what it means is it's a piece of paper that is backed by the US government, the US military. They promise you that they will, they give you a note that is worth so much gold in a bank that they own. So it's not even real, so they just print it. I don't know if you saw, but Biden just said that he's gonna print $100 billion to support the two wars. Fuck off. 100 billion. Yeah, so he just makes print it. it. So, yeah. That's inflation, people, by the That's way. That's inflation, <laughs> And they're saying the inflation is 7%, but I think it's more like 18%. Yeah. That's another... So if you're saving... So here's... A, if you don't know what money is, basics. If you don't know what money is, and you're talking about inflation, inflation is basically the buying power of your money. So this piece of paper that you have that you can trade for something, you can say you can trade that for a... I don't know, a meat, a loaf, a loaf of bread. You can trade 10 bucks for a loaf of bread. The next year goes by... You can trade it for 10% less of how big that was. You've got the same amount of money, but what you can buy with it goes down. If you look at Venezuela, what happened there and all, whatever. Yeah. So if you understand that money only exists because they print it, and you understand that the buying power of it is going down every single year, and because of inflation, because they're printing more of it to fund wars, then you understand that when you get money, you need to spend it on something that is deflationary. Ethereum would be a good uh, a good go, but anything that's deflationary, silver, gold, things that are going to fight against if you're trying to save money. And you have to understand if you're a guy out there that makes 40 grand a year or 35 grand a year and your outgoings are 30 grand a year and you can save five grand a year, you are never going to have money 
say five grand a year for 20 years. It's not, it's just not gonna, it's not, it's not gonna pay to go on holiday. You have to out earn what you're doing. So the only way to have more money is to work for more money. So you need to understand that you need to push yourself to make more or to, to they say like, no one can make money apart from the, the U.S. government. So you can't make money. You have to take money. You have to be able to take more. You have to be able to get more. You have to be able to. Ex- you have to be able to explain to someone else that you should give me more money because of this. So how do you do that? You increase your skills. You learn more. So when people say like, "Oh, I'm struggling to make money," what are you doing? If you're just going to the same job every single day, expecting to make more money, or I'm saving this, I'm doing this, or does it's not going to work? If you understand what money is, and the money is getting weaker and weaker every year, and trust me, fiat currency is going to disappear. It will not exist. I'm going to say 10 years. You won't even have a U.S. dollar. Like this. So what's going to happen to the monetary system? How is it all going to change? If you start educating yourself, learning about it, learn about the war, what's going on, why is the war happening? Why have we got this whole thing going on with Ukraine and Russia? What's the reason for it? What's behind it? What's the government about? These all lead to what money is, right? And money is not, like I said, it's not what you think it is. It's just made up. It's just, like, I hate quoting Tate because and I talk, and some of the theories I talk about come from him as well. But when he said money isn't real, he doesn't mean it the way you think he means it. Of course, you have to pay for things. Yeah, of course. But money does not exist. It's, it's a made up concept. It doesn't exist. You have just been told and trained from a young age that money is, is important. It's not important. It's not real. They are deciding what the value of it. So... When you understand that, you understand that when you get a little bit of it, what you need to do with it. And the best thing you can do is invest in yourself because they can never take that away from you. They can never take your mind away from you. They can never take who you are away from you. They can never take, if you build up a personal brand and a presence on the internet, they can never take that away from you. You even know, the cunts try. Even if they try. <laughs> okay. And of course they try. Mean. And they're going to try more and more and more. But that, so for, again, I've spoken quite a lot about going about this forever, but if you're the average guy, 35, 40 years old, been working the same job for 10, 20 years, and you're trying to work out how to make money, you've got to do something different. You have to leverage yourself differently. You have a skill. Trust me. If you've been doing something for 20 years, you're an expert at that thing. Teach other people how to do it. Try and think of a way that you can add value to the world. Like I said, the more value you add to the world, the more money's in your bank account. I love that. That phrase is so amazing. If you all just go into the same office every day and just type in, and, and simple things, if you're a young guy and you're 20 years old and you go into the office and you want a promotion, turn up at work an hour late early every morning. Hour early every morning, leave an hour late every night. Not hard. Give up more time. Sacrifice yourself to, to get to the certain level where I can now I'm promoted. Now I earn a little bit extra every year. Now I can invest this. Again, people think about the end product. They think about buying the, the supercar or buying the house. Or, not about that. It's about putting the fundamental steps in place that are going to improve your life and going to make you a better employee, make you more valuable to the world. So again, summarize the answer. What, 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 what can an average guy do? If they talk, want- we've talked about zero to one before. I think this link, zero to one. Yeah, we've talked about this. This links in really well. What, so what's that? So zero to one for me is that we just spoke about it a second ago yeah. when we talking about jujitsu. Mm-hmm. We had a two belt, two, two belt, two white stripe, two, two, stri- two, two, two stripe two white belt. belt. That's what yeah, I'm trying yeah. to get out. Becoming a two-stripe world boy, you're better than 95% of the world. Mm. So if you go from zero to one, so I'm saying if you're an expert at laying bricks, you're a bricklayer, and you're an expert at laying bricks, you could lay bricks for the, every day for the rest of your life. Now, if you spend 18 minutes a day doing something else, you do that for a year, you're mm. better than 95% of the world. So you can then sell whatever you learn to 95% of the world because they don't know how to do it. If you want to become a copywriter, if you're AI, AI is taking off, so you need to learn about AI because that's going to demolish everyone's jobs. Uh, isn't it? So yeah. everyone change. Yeah. If you know anything about AI and you know and you've done anything with AI, you could understand the fear and the urgency people should have to try and innovate and change and become different. But again, AI can't take the fact the way that I'm Luke Barnett. It cannot do that. It cannot take that away from me. It can pretend to be me, and it could make deep fake, and we could go oh, all that crap. <laughs> but it can never change the, what I add to the world because it can never replace that. So. Going from zero to one is just, if you can do that in as many fields as possible, you can increase your chances of making money. Mm -hmm. I was, I'm going to say dumb would be the wrong word because I've never been dumb, but I was a fully focused fighter, cage fighter. All I cared about was becoming the best cage fighter I could possibly be. I did that for 17 years. I decided, right, now I'm going to make money. Transferred all those skills over and just focused on trying to make money. I'm still not there yet where I want to be, but I'm doing all right. So it's like, and I, and I also know it's inevitable that I'm going to. 
So what I was going to say is if you're that average guy working that job, all you have to do is switch your focus into going down a different path. And it might take you 10 years. But in 10 years, you'll finally be able to replace that income that you're getting from this job with something that has a higher ceiling, mm. you know, something that is, can, can earn a, a, as much money as you want it to earn, like a, with a business that you could get to seven, eight, nine, ten 10 figures. But you at least just start walking in that direction. And you'll see slowly as you build it up, you're walking it away from that nine to five lifestyle. Obviously, it's not going to happen like that. It's going to take years. Of understanding and, then, and to try to de develop something but people are scared to do it because they don't know how to go from zero to one like you're saying so going from zero to one is the is the magic so try and go zero to one in as many things as you can learn to play the piano 18 minutes a day okay now i know to play the piano better than 95 percent of the world okay and let's try and I, what happened to me i'll never forget it we were sitting at a table and people were talking about sales funnels right and i was like what is a sales funnel? Because I'm just some dumb cage fighter. I don't know anything about sales or funnels or anything. So I'm sitting there and these guys are talking about sales. They didn't use the word sales funnels. They just said funnels. Because everyone knows what a funnel is. Yeah, of course they do. Right? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> and I'm like, um, sorry, what is a funnel? And they're like, and good, because I'm not afraid to say I don't understand. What is a funnel? They explain to me what a funnel is. And they get most of the average guys walking out that don't know what a funnel is because they're the ones getting stuck in and buying things. So it was like, yeah. this was now three years ago or two and a half years ago, maybe that. And now I have quite a complicated sales funnel, which I was even explaining to some of you, yeah. uh, some, of, some of the ways I'm going to improve that. And I'm, I just focus 20 minutes a day or 20 minutes a day over a week or hours to, to, to become better at generating sales funnels because that's how I make money because... You can have the best product in the world, but if you don't have a funnel, how are you going to get people to it? So again, little things, little movements, they, they, they go a long way. So if you're stuck in that lifestyle, just start stepping a different way. Uh, believe in the process and understand that it's going to work and keep pushing. And eventually you'll be able to quit that job, do something different, and you, you can make endless money. Money's in the sky. You just need to understand how to leverage it. And I know it's not that simple. I'm not an idiot. I'm, and the problem with a lot of people that talk about these sort of subjects is they talk in absolutes. They talk like, this is what you do. This is how you do it. Because that's how you get views. That's how you sound like you know what you're on about. It's difficult. It's not easy, especially if you're not used to it and you don't understand what you're doing. And you're going to make mistakes. Just get on with it and just do it. And that's how I, I have led my life like that. And it's never failed me. Just get on with it. If you fuck up, if, I had a reel that I, well, my editors made me a reel and it makes me sound like an absolute retard. It's me talking about, I did a long form piece of content on YouTube and they cut it down to a short form. Yeah. And it's me talking about restaurants. Maybe you heard it, I don't know. I don't know. But it's me talking about setting your own standards and how I only order off menu and all that. And I just sound like some arrogant prick that walks into a restaurant and go, and those are people that made memes about it and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, I don't, I honestly, it doesn't matter, but I'm just saying like that I fucked up because the editor, May, I, I just posted it because I'm posting three, two, three times a day. But that, my edit will improve, my understanding of the audience will improve, and I'll get better and better and better and better. But it's like that's an example of something. Did it get views of? It got a lot of views. <laughs> yeah. So is there, is there any bad content if you get views? I don't know. I mean, that's, <laughs> that, 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 that's another argument. You know what but, I mean? Like, I mean, if you sound like an idiot, then it's, uh, for me, it's not the best. But oh, they, no they, they say <laughs> the same as there's, there's no plenty of rich fucking idiots out there, isn't there? There's no such thing as good and bad, good and bad news, right? There's mm. news is news, and then mm. you get clicks. But I think um, all I'm trying to say is you, you don't need to know how to do the thing. Mm -hmm. You just need to start doing the thing. I think it's the biggest thing. People, a lot of people don't start, isn't it? They just don't ever start. They don't ever take that, that fucking plunge. And I, I, I always wonder what, what, what do they think is, is going to happen? What are they going to lose by spending, like you said, 18 minutes a day just doing something else, you know? Even a side project, something that they're doing. You don't even have to tell people. That's the other thing as well. They think you've got to fucking announce it all the time. Just do something on your own. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just do something quietly that no one even knows, you know, and then progress that towards something, again, years by, that they can do. Mm, 100%. Uh, Luke, I feel like we've gone for fucking ages, mate. I'm maybe way over time. It's been good. I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. But we have gone for a while. Yeah, no, it's good. I was just going to give you the opportunity, mate, to talk a little bit about some of the uh, some of the stuff that you offer in regard to services. I know we touched on it in the beginning, but where can people find you if they want to... Um, well, I mean... Um, you can find me anywhere, really. I'm sure it'll be put in the, in the links below. But my YouTube channel is probably the best. I give out loads of free advice. And I, I do, I am, my goal at the moment, again, I'm all about setting goals and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff, is to put out 52 podcasts in 52 weeks. I'm about 22 in, probably by, by the time this gets released, probably later more. 
Um, but yeah, so my YouTube is Luke Barnett Official. It's Barnett, B-A-R-N-A-T-T. -T. I'm sure if you're watching this, you'll know. Um, and then you can find me on X, you can find me on Instagram, you can find me, I'm, out, I'm everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'll be all over your screens. Soon. They call it omnipresent. Omnipresent. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so if you, uh, I'm sure the links will be below, click on them. And then I'll put my mentorship now, which is just launched as a leverage product. So talking about what we were doing before, I was doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. Mm. I was charging a pretty high price, like a high ticket price for it. Now it's much more low ticket, but I can reach tens, hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of people. So uh, I can reach more people with that. And it's, it's easy to do. You can find that again on my Instagram or whatever, mm -hmm. but... Um, yeah, that's pretty much me. My at the moment, my focus is all about creating content, and I want to make as much good content and improve it from those reels that I've made before, and get better and better and better. Mm. Brilliant, mate. Well, I appreciate you having us on, mate, Thanks, or mate. hosting us and coming on, should I say? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.